Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue. Today we're back at Duelist Den. And this week my subject is going to be the Star Double Action Revolver. Now the thing about this is, if you follow the channel at all, you know that a couple of months ago, maybe three, I did a video on Star Revolvers, both double action and the single action. And in that video, I demonstrated why I didn't like this gun because I've had it for 20 years and it never ran for me. It jammed constantly, hardly ever set off caps. It's just awful. So for 20 years, this gun was a photo prop. Uh, but I tried it in the video just to show you. And when I got home, I thought, you know what? I am sick of this gun being a photo prop. So I sent it off to David Stavlo at Lodgewood Manufacturing. And I said, David, can you get this action running for me? And I got to admit, David said it was a challenge. He said there's nothing wrong with it. It just, nothing fits together just right. <laughs> but he got it running. It runs very smoothly now. Uh, but I still had a problem with caps. And what I found out is that the nipples were too thick. And caps would not seat all the way down on them. Uh, finally, I got caps to fire by slitting them up the skirts. Uh, so that they would go all the way down. And that was no good. So I fitted this with slick shot nipples and I think it's going to do the trick. So let's load it up and give it a try. Okay, I'm going to demonstrate loading this with round balls, um, which I'm guessing for the most part, that's what you all are going to be doing, most of you. Now, actually it would have been loaded historically with paper cartridges and I'll, I'll demonstrate that later. But for now, we'll do the round balls. So this gun's a little bit different. You can't hammer cock it. If you do, you can mess up the action. This trigger here, what we would call a trigger, is a cocking lever. I'm going to cock it back to the safety notch. Now I still can't rotate the cylinder unless I pull the trigger a bit. All right, that's one of the things I don't like about this, but uh, there you have it. So I'm going to load 30 grains of 3FG black powder and I'm going to dump that into a chamber. Make sure that's empty. Now I like to use these pre-greased felt wads. These are made by me and there is a video on the channel you can search for uh, homemade felt wads and it'll tell you how to do it. I'm just going to push it in with a pen. Now I'm using a 454 ball. I'm going to pop that on top. Now I'm going to rotate this. I got to pull the trigger a little bit. Rotate it under the rammer. Get it lined up and then put it in. Now the thing about this is, it is a short barrel, which means a short rammer, so you don't have as much, as much leverage on it, but there you go, seat it in, and we've got a ring of lead shaved off, which seals the chamber. Now these guns had a tendency, the originals, to chain fire. And that's because there's no guards around the nipples. They're not recessed. So we'll see how this does, because that's what the originals would have done. I'm going to load the other five. I'm going to load them all, because this has 12 cylinder stops. Right, these little grooves here. Which means I can stop it between two nipples and, and hold that safely. So that's what I'm going to do. So let me finish loading. So the final step is to cap it. I'm using Remington number 10 caps. Like I said, I put slick shot nipples on this and I'm using my Scandinavian Swedish capper. So I'm just going to get in there and cap each one of these up.
I, I like this because it keeps me from fumble fingering them on and, and it fits into most every nook and cranny for capping something so it's, it's, uh, it's actually pretty useful. I run two of these. I keep one in the cap pouch on my belt in case caps get knocked off you know when I'm actually on the firing line and that does happen. It's a lot easier to get a replacement on this way. Okay, there we go, all capped up. Well, I'm out here facing down Evil Roy again, and I've got to admit, I've got some butterflies in my stomach, because this is my first time live firing the star since I've worked on it. But I've tried it with just caps, and it's run okay, but now it's for real. So is Evil Roy going to take me out, or is the star going to come through for me? I'm going to try it in single action, and we'll see. Okay. Well, that's one. Still two. Three. Well, we got them all to go off. Took a little bit of work, but it did it. <laughs> that might be a first for the star. Cut. All right, so the way you fire a star in single or double action mode is quite different from any other revolver of the Civil War era. First of all, this thing that looks like a trigger is not. It's a lifting lever. Its whole job is to lift the hammer. There, lift into full cock. Now you can't thumb cock it. If you do, you can mess up the action. The actual trigger is this little piece right back here. And when you fire, you press that. Well, you know, as I said, I covered single and double action stars uh, two or three months ago here on the channel. And the history I'm going to give you today is largely a recap of that because the history of the gun has not changed in the last couple of months. Um, what's changed is its ability to go bang. But still, this is kind of a fascinating gun, these stars. I mean, William Money, aka Clint Eastwood, used one in Unforgiven. Uh, much better than I can use one, I have to say. Uh, because I'll just tell you right off the bat, the sighting equipment in here... Let me get... Uh, get it kind of cocked. The sighting equipment in here is very much like a Colt revolver. There's a notch in the hammer nose and of course there's a front sight that is dovetailed to its credit. Now the problem with that is in double action you have no rear sight effectively. You can't use that hammer nose while it's coming back and forth back and forth. So good luck. <laughs> you know it's when you're shooting this thing double action it's just front sight front sight front sight as my old instructor used to say. And that's as good as it gets. So, that's kind of a problem. And that could have been fixed very easily by dovetailing a blade front sight right there. 
Uh, and I could do that. That is not beyond my capabilities by any means. But I've never seen an original done up like that. Which surprises me because I've seen blade front sights on every kind of Colt, or blade rear sights I should say, on every kind of Colt fitted on the barrel, you know, generally. Uh, so people recognized that as a better way to go, and, and there were people who would do it. Now the problem with the stars is probably very few of them saw the light of day uh, until they were on the surplus market. So maybe that's why nobody ever did it. Now even though this, this replica was made by Pieta in Italy, and I, I got mine from Dixie Gunworks, uh, but they have not been manufactured for quite a few years now from Pieta. Uh, and neither of the single actions. Uh, more is a pity because the single actions run just fine. But the originals were made by Ebenezer Starr. And the Starr family was a, uh, a noted family in the weapons industry. But what they were noted for was swords, sabers, and knives. Not guns. But... Uh, Ebenezer proved to be an exception to that rule. He was a kind of a gun design and genius in his own way. So Ebenezer, or uh, Eben as he preferred to be called, and who can blame him, he patented his first double action revolver which was a 36 caliber back in 1858. We got an airplane going overhead. All right, so I'm sure you can hear that plane, <laughs> you know, on, on the videotape. Uh, and we have them going over all the time. Excuse me while I scratch my little head. So I'm, I'm always, you see a lot of edits in my videos when I'm talking. A lot of the times it's because I'm stopping it because of those planes. And what they're doing, a little prop job, uh, is they are looking for moonshine stills and pot farms, marijuana farms, uh, which the woods are littered with. <laughs> you know, you're one of the reasons why if you go into, you know, national forests here in Pennsylvania or Kentucky or probably the same anywhere in the country, but the areas that I know, you'd better go armed because you never know when you're going to run into disgruntled pot farmers who don't really want you around. Um, and if you're armed, it's usually easier to walk away <laughs> with no harm, no foul on anybody's side. Um, so, anyway, plane's gone. Back to the video. So he patented that 36 caliber double action revolver and he sold it to the Navy. He sold him 500 uh, units for $20 a piece, which was a fairly princely sum in those days, especially those pre-war days. And that was his start in the firearms industry. Now before the war, Starr sold about 3,000 of those 36 caliber double action revolvers. But when the war broke out, the um, Secretary of War was looking for 44 caliber revolvers to outfit the army. And, you know, like so often, uh, in the past, we went to war with, with the storehouses empty and the ranks depleted and, you know, it's like we never believe it's going to happen until it happens. So they were looking for any kind of 44 caliber revolver they could find. And Starr had no problem upscaling his double action revolver to the 44 caliber version that you see now. And the Army bought about 20,000 of those. And they hated them. <laughs> Just hated them. In fact, most of them were never issued. And they went back to Eben Star and said, um, 
Hey Bubba, do you think you can make a single action version of that gun with a conventional trigger? Maybe an 8 inch barrel? And he said, maybe. What are you going to pay? And they said, at least $25 a piece. Maybe 30 he said, done, done and done. <laughs> and he went to work, turned them out, and they became the third most popular sidearm in the Union forces after the Colt 1860 Army and the Remington New Model Army. So, and you saw me shoot that a few months ago, and it's all just fine. So, this time, we're going to try to give the double action its due. And uh, maybe we'll see if William Money had something on the ball when he used one of these. Maybe I'll be able to use one as well. I rather doubt it though, but uh, let's see how it goes. Well, I'm gonna try the star for the first time in double action mode. And I have to admit, I don't think my chances are that good of even hitting Evil Roy, because you can't use the sights at all on this thing. I'm just gonna be putting the front sight on it and praying. So, Steel Steve provides a little bit of a bigger target, and that's who I'm gonna go after. So, Steve, I'm coming for you. Well, it seems like double action better than single action. It's still got a tendency to jam even after all of Dave's work on it. And he did tell me, he said there's no reason for it to do. It just does. Uh, but it's way better than when I sent it to him, so I can't complain. So this is, it seems like mostly a double action proposition. I've been shooting the star double action all day. Probably got about 40 rounds through it. So here are my final impressions of it. Uh, first of all, I never could have got 40 rounds through it before David Stavlo did his magic on it. So it's already a thousand percent better than the gun I had for 20 years. That said, it is still an absolute piece of garbage. I mean, it ran about 80% of the time. Uh, that's just not good enough. Now, I'll be honest, over the years, uh, because this has been such a disappointment to me, I have queried other Star Double Action owners to see how their guns ran. And uh, I've met a couple whose guns ran beautiful right out of the box and they've been running them for years and years. And when I say a couple of people, I mean two, <laughs> okay? Uh, most people have had the kinds of problems that I've had to one degree or another. I probably have the worst case scenario, but I've met other people who are just as bad. Now, some people have had exactly the same problems I've had and have been able to get the guns reworked or worked on themselves until eventually they had a very reliable shooter. That is less than half of the people I've talked to who've owned these. Uh, more than half of them have been in the same boat as me. They've never worked. They've never been able to get them to work. They traded them off. Um, I mean, personally, I would rather go into combat with a squirt gun loaded with bleach than with one of these things. Just too unreliable. Now, you know, you might say, well, it's just the replica. You know, not well made. There's some truth to that, though I suspect part of the not well made is it's difficult to make them well. Uh, I mean, they bought 23,000 of these and they only issued about 3,000 of them. 
the rest went into a warehouse never to be seen again until they were sold for surplus. And, and considering how badly the War Department needed handguns, that says something about them. Right? It says nobody wanted them. And I've got to say, even if this was running 100%, it would still be garbage. Because you really can't aim it. And uh, the way you shoot it single action, right, which is you cock it with this, then you got to pull that little trigger back there. Well, you try that when people are shooting at you because, you know, as a friend of mine said, trigger pull, man, you could squeeze a brick to dust when the bullets are flying because you get so much adrenaline. Uh, so trying to gently raise this to the point it stops so you can take aim and shoot. Ah, good luck. Good luck. And as far as aiming it in double action mode, because the sight's on the back of the hammer, you just can't. Right? I mean, the best thing you can do is put the front sight on it and uh, wail away. Uh, which, which I did with some success. I got, I'm looking at Steel Steve right now. One, two, three, four. All right, so I put five out of six in them, and that's with having a couple of failures to fire and having to cycle around again. So you can hit your man if your man is about 15 yards away and you're a good shot. Uh, I'm not as good a shot as I once was, but I'm still okay. But I'll tell you what, for the average recruit or officer who got this pistol just before going into battle and the first time they shot it was when the bullets were flying back at them, no way. No way. If, if you hit anybody, it wasn't the guy you were looking at, probably. So... My thoughts on this pistol? No. <laughs> Big mistake. Uh, and that's why I think the Secretary of War asked Star to, uh, to make a single action version. So there's a reason though that they asked Star to make a single action because they could have just done what they did with Savage and said, man, we never want to see you again, go away. And, and that is because this gun, despite its flaws, had a few pretty innovative good ideas on it. It had the 12-cylinder stops, and the cylinder stop cuts, the bolt cuts on these, are so narrow that they do nothing to weaken the chamber. So that's, that's kind of a good thing. Uh, it's, it's got the top brake design with that center arbor, pointed center arbor, and I'll tell you what, I put like 40 rounds through this and no drag at all from fouling. None. And it's the same thing with the single action. They are lovely as far as handling fouling goes. So, there were some very good things about the star that made the War Department say, you know, if we could get this without all the garbage, it might be a pretty good pistol. And, and it is. Anybody who has a chance to get a single action star, I recommend you do it. They're a little bit different. They got a really Euro grip. I mean, this is the kind of grip that you find on British revolvers. But I'll tell you what, on this, it's actually very comfortable to shoot. Uh, you know, unlike when you get it on the, uh, the Smith & Wesson Russian, where it's not comfortable to shoot. This, very comfortable. It's, it's, uh, it's like shooting an Adams, you know, British Adams. Very, very comfortable gun to shoot. So that was all, all the plus. So you see a single action for a good price, pick it up. You see one of these for a good price? Run, run the other way. Unless, like me, you want one as a representative gun, which is what this gun has been for me for 20 years, because it hasn't run. So it's been a photo prop and a representative gun when I'm explaining guns of the Civil War, things like that. Uh, and if you can get one for a good price, that's fine. And you might even get lucky and it might even run and you could shoot it. Uh, but I wouldn't take that bet. You know, so unless, unless you really want one as a representative gun, if you're dying to have a good shooter of these, the only way you can get one is to find somebody who's got a good shooter that you trust, you know it runs, <laughs> you might even try it yourself, and, and then you buy it. Because otherwise, the run of the mill of these things, they, they don't run. There you go. So, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. 
I'll be honest with you, I had fun shooting it despite the frustrations. I mean, when this baby ran in double action mode, it's just a hoot. Like any double action black powder revolver is fun to shoot because you are issuing fire and brimstone like the hand of the Lord. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a ball. Uh, the unfortunate thing about this is it doesn't hit what it's aimed at all the time, but, uh, but it does throw those fireballs pretty nice. So anyway, I enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, hit subscribe, right? Hit the thumbs up and come on back next week. And we'll show you something else. Till then, bye.